Hello, uh, welcome to this first lecture on uh, the course uh, Dynamics of Classical and Quantum Fields. So, I want to start this lecture uh, with a description of uh, point particle classical mechanics uh, that you are all familiar with, so namely Lagrangian mechanics. So, I want to specifically uh, remind you how the Lagrange equations are derived uh, starting from Newton's second law of motion. Uh, it is true that uh, I expect these uh, topics to be prerequisites for this course, but I am just refreshing your memory. So, let me begin by uh, pointing out that uh, the fundamental uh, feature of this particular course is the notion of a dynamical system with infinitely many degrees of freedom. So, specifically that infinity is of the continuous kind. In other words, it is not discreetly infinite, it is actually continuously infinite. So, that is the reason why I have uh, titled the first chapter as countable and uncountable. So, this chapter like I am just going to uh, intermittently read off uh, the chapter sentences themselves because they are quite well written. So, uh, this chapter deals with the analogy between classical mechanics of discrete particles and that of a continuum. Okay. So, uh, this chapter also includes uh, worked out examples of dynamical fields that you will see later on and the uh, uh, aim of this chapter is to introduce the readers to the subject through uh, semi-realistic examples uh, that will enable you to formulate and solve problems on your own. Okay, uh, let me get to the uh, uh, brief uh, reminder of what Lagrangian mechanics is. So, you all know that uh, in Lagrangian mechanics, the uh, basic feature of Lagrangian mechanics is that it uh, is able to handle constraints. So, in other words, you can uh, Normally, what happens in Newton's second law is that uh, in order to utilize U Newton's second law, you have to specify the forces explicitly including forces of constraint. So, if, if you do not know what I am talking about, let me remind you that forces of constraints could be, for example, you can have a mass that is sliding along on a ring. The point is the forces that constrain the mass to the ring are quite complicated and usually not known. What Lagrangian mechanics allows you to do is that it allows you to work, it is a workaround which enables you to solve uh, the interesting dynamical questions without having to know what exactly the forces are that constrain the, the particle to slide along the ring. So, those are the forces of constraints which uh, Newton's second law will require you to know but Lagrangian mechanics allows you to bypass and uh, allows you to not uh, solve the problem without knowing what they are. So, the way this is accomplished is the, by the introduction of what are known as generalized coordinates. So, there is a distinction between the actual coordinates of a particle which is basically the position of the particle in three dimensions. So, it's a, suppose your particle is we all know that in general every particle is located in three dimensions. So, strictly speaking you always require three coordinates to describe uh, the location of the particle whether it is uh, the Cartesian x, y, z coordinates or the polar r, theta, phi coordinates or whatever else. So, but then the point is that when you have constraints it is obvious that you do not require three, you require fewer than three that is because you already know the particle is say constrained to move on a circle or it is constrained to move on the surface of a sphere or it is uh, constrained to follow a certain path or, or live on a certain surface. So, in that case uh, you need fewer and the idea is that the fewer generalized coordinates are described by basically q1, q2, q3 up to qs. So, the small letter s that I am describing here in so, let me uh, write something and tell you what, what I am talking about. So, this s here, so this s uh, refers to the number of generalized coordinates. So, in other words that could be 2 if uh, I am talking about uh, a particle that is uh, otherwise in 3 dimension but lives on a surface. 
So, it could be just one if uh, there is a particle that normally lives in three dimension, but forced to slide along a circle along the circumference of a ring. So, uh, the bottom line is you need fewer than the actual number of uh, dimensions in the problem. So, now the point is that uh, if you have large number of such particles, the position of each of those particles r i is described by specifying the configuration of generalized coordinates. So, in other words by specifying the generalized coordinates, uh, the magnitude of those generalized coordinates, uh, so in other words their numerical values, you will be successful in uh, locating each of those particles, uh, their physical locations are therefore specified. So, that is what we mean by saying that uh, particles obey constraints. So, in other words they are described by a uh, fewer set of coordinates which we call generalized coordinates. So, that is the beauty of the Lagrangian formalism that it allows you to take into account constraints in this very transparent way without having to indirectly uh, deduce uh, those uh, conditions through the specification of forces which we usually do not know anyway. Okay. So, uh, so now if, as we all know the uh, Newton's second law talks about uh, the uh, mass times acceleration being the force. So, it is written in this form uh, mass times acceleration is force where r is the uh, position vector of the ith particle and v i. So, I should have written possibly well it this this r actually now is a collection it could be the the collection of all the particles. So, you, you see the point is that I have deliberately written r because um, it is quite possible uh, that the forces acting on the ith particle depend on the location of all the other particles as well. So, so I think uh, it is uh, it is not an oversight or a typing error it is specifically meant to say this. So, uh, less usually it could also depend upon the velocities of all the other particles or uh, including its own. So, uh, so this would be the, the ultra general way of writing Newton's second law. So, the question is now uh, of course, uh, in most examples these forces are never fully specified. Uh, usually, we only know the forces that we are explicitly applying to the system, but the forces of constraints that are also present that uh, force those particles to move in a certain way that constrain them to move along surfaces or, or rings and so on. They are not specified and they are not of much interest either. So, it would be very desirable to have a technique which enables us to uh, not consider them at all. So, that technique is precisely the Lagrangian approach to classical mechanics. So, uh, so having said all this, uh, let us uh, start by trying to find out the acceleration of the ith particle in terms of the rates of change of the generalized coordinates themselves. So, now the ith particles position is described by the specification of these s generalized coordinates. Now, if I find the velocity vectors, so remember what this is, this is the rate of change of position which is uh, the velocity. So, the velocity vector is, uh, is basically determined by chain rule by um, partially differentiating the position with respect to the each of the generalized coordinates and then uh, multiplying it by the rate of change of uh, the that particular generalized coordinates. And then you have to make sure you take into account all of them which basically means that you sum over all the generalized coordinates. So, now having found the velocity we can go, go ahead and uh, find the acceleration by simply differentiating once more. So, if I differentiate once more so, those of you who are following along should uh, put in some effort to fill in the steps. If you feel that uh, it is not obvious how I got from 
this step to the next step. So, you should not uh, uh, switch off and pretend that you have understood, but you should pause the video and then make sure you actually understand how I went from that step to the next. So, here in particular, uh, the way I reached 1.4 from 1.3 was that I differentiated 1.3 once again and uh, so that meant that I have to do this. and also that. So, I differentiate this first and then multiply by that or alternatively um, differentiate this first and multiply by that. Okay. So, uh, so when I do that, the, this is pretty much what I get. But then uh, the question is, uh, what is this? This is again, you have to redo the chain rule all over again. So, basically, if you want to differentiate with respect to time, you first differentiate with respect to generalized coordinate and then differentiate the generalized coordinate with respect to time. So, that is precisely what you get here. So, uh, d by dt would be basically uh, q dot k d by d q k summed over all the k's. So, then I am going to insert that here and then th this is what I get. Okay. So, I hope this is clear. So, there are some steps missing when I go from 1.3 to 1.4. Okay, so let us proceed. So, now this is the acceleration and why did I want acceleration because Newton's second law tells me that the left hand side of Newton's second law involves acceleration. So, mass times acceleration is force. So, which is why I needed acceleration. Now, I have successfully expressed the acceleration in terms of the derivatives, time derivatives of the generalized coordinates. So, now, uh, let us go ahead and substitute equation 1.4 into equation 1.1. So, that will that will allow us to write mass times acceleration in purely in terms of the time derivatives of the generalized coordinates equals force. Okay, so, that force is something very complex, it could be very complicated and usually uh, we do not even know all the components beforehand because uh, like I told you, usually the forces, the components of forces that are known are the forces that you yourself have decided to apply on the system. There are other forces which the circumstances that the system finds itself in, uh, those circumstances apply those forces which Newton's law also requires you to know, but practically there is no way of knowing what they are. Like I told you, the forces of constraints. So, the, the forces that a ring might be uh, applying on a mass that is sliding on it uh, in order to force that mass to remain on the ring. So, that is of uh, that is of no interest to anyone except that it is important in ensuring that the mass slides on the ring and you have no way of knowing what that force is. So, it is really desirable to have a technique which does not involve that force at all and that is what Lagrangian mechanics allows you to do. Okay, so, let us proceed and see how it allows us to do this. So, at this stage 1.5 involves all components of the force including forces of constraints. So, we have to somehow get rid of, we have to cleverly get rid of the constraint forces. Okay, so, the way this is gotten rid of is that obviously, there are more components of forces than there are components that you already know about. So, so in order to get rid of the components that we do not care about, what we do is that we multiply by, we take the dot product of this uh, equation 1.5. Uh, we take the dot product with respect to uh, 
the rate of change of the position with respect to the kth generalized coordinate. So, we take the rate of change of the position of the ith particle in terms of the kth generalized coordinate and we sum over all the particles. So, you might be wondering this is a very arbitrary operation and why did we do it? What is the motivation? So, you will uh, soon see that there is a very good reason for doing this and so let us proceed further and then somewhere down the road I will tell you what the motivation is. At this stage it seems very ad hoc. So, now let us at least proceed uh, algebraically and see if we can simplify these equations uh, until we can understand what is going on and why we did all this. So, um, keep in mind that the kinetic energy of the system of particles is basically given by mass times square of velocity divided by 2 summed over all the particles which is what this is. So, now uh, like we said earlier the velocity of the ith particle is expressible in terms of the rates of change of the generalized coordinates of the uh, of those corresponding particles. So, uh, if that is the case then the kinetic energy is expressible in terms of uh, the rates of change of the generalized coordinates of the various particles. So, having written the uh, kinetic energy of the system in terms of the rates of change of generalized coordinates, now uh, let me tell you what it is I am trying to do. So, basically you see in uh, 1.6 uh, there is this rather complicated looking set of terms. So, what we want to do is basically express uh, some combinations of these in terms of derivatives of quantities which are of physical interest like kinetic energy and so on that we can easily identify with. Because at this stage these, uh, these quantities seem very arbitrary and they are not familiar to us and so it is. So, what we are doing now is uh, this exercise is to render 1.6 into a form that is uh, more familiar to us. So, in other words express it in terms of quantities that are more familiar. So, you have to admit certainly that the kinetic energy of the system of particles is a familiar quantity and it would be really nice if we could express some of those terms in terms of some appropriate derivatives of the kinetic energy. So, that is what we are doing here. So, if you take the derivative of the kinetic energy with respect to the rate of change of uh, the generalized coordinate and then you further differentiate with respect to time. Okay, so, uh, again I could be skipping a lot of steps, but then it is uh, really important for you to uh, not only here, but throughout the course it is important for you to make sure that you do not uh, that you understand each and every step and if you do not understand you please pause the video and work out the intermediate steps and only then proceed because there is uh, you cannot really follow physics uh, if you just take the word of the instructor uh, as if uh, it is something uh, everybody knows. It is for you to understand everybody may know, but uh, you are the student uh, or the listener who is trying to follow and you have to understand by putting in that effort. Okay, so, so, the question is how do you proceed from here? So, it is obvious that the derivative of the kinetic energy with, the, with respect to the rate of change of uh, generalized coordinate is this. Now, if you differentiate with respect to time, you get, uh, you get all these terms. So, it is obvious where this comes from. So, like I told you, you differentiate uh, with respect to time. So, there are three things which are potentially time dependent, these three, right. So, if you want to differentiate the left hand side with respect to time, what you do is uh, you first differentiate this with respect to time, multiply it by whatever was there already, then you differentiate this with respect to time. But then once you differentiate something with respect to time which implicitly depends on time through the generalized coordinates, you have to of course also invoke the chain rule all over again. So, when you invoke the chain rule, you get these uh, terms. So, uh, so I am not going to fill in absolutely all the steps, but I am just pointing out to you where they come from. So, this come, these two terms come from invoking chain rule, okay. Whereas, this is obvious where it comes from, it is just differentiating this once more.
Okay, uh, so now, uh, now what you do is that you notice that uh, this 1.6, so let us remember what that is. Look, there is a term involving second derivative uh, with respect to uh, the generalized coordinate and that is what uh, this is, right. So that times, notice that these two get multiplied, right. So that is what this is. So the derivative of uh, the position with respect to generalized coordinate times something very similar times the second derivative of the generalized coordinate and that is what that is. So now uh, plus this term and together gives you this term. But then there is uh, this term that, uh, that gets left out, okay. So these two put together becomes this. Okay, this gets left out. So, let this be as it is. But now, go back and uh, differentiate this kinetic energy not with respect to q dot, but with respect to q. So, in other words, see here, notice that I have differentiated with respect to q dot. That is of course, a different thing altogether. So, so you are aware that uh, q dot in Lagrangian, uh, well, that is the, I mean, that is the implication. So, if I say partial q dot. Uh, the implication is q dot is independent of q. So, you might be wondering how, how can that be, how can q dot be independent of q. It obviously is uh, if you do not know if the trajectory of the particle is not specified, if the dependence of q on time is completely arbitrary, there is absolutely no earthly relation between q and q dot. The, a particle can be anywhere it wants and have any velocity it wants. These two are unrelated. Position and velocity can be completely unrelated unless you already know what the trajectory is. But of course, we do not know what the trajectory is because that is what we are trying to determine right now. So, we do not a priori, we do not know what the trajectory is. So, at this stage q and q dot are completely independent. So, if that is the case, then uh, the rate of change of the kinetic energy with respect to q is given by this formula, is not it? So, uh, so where does this come from? So, notice that these two are uh, by definition independent of, uh, uh, independent of q. Uh, so, but then the, the q dependence is only contained here and it is very symmetrical. So, if you differentiate both twi uh, once, uh, you will get a factor of 2 and you get this result, okay. So, now you go ahead and subtract these two uh, formulas, okay. So, uh, point is that I am going to subtract this and this, I am going to subtract uh, these two. So, if I subtract these two, what I get is exactly this, okay. So, I, I get that. So, I subtract these two and I get this. So, now when I subtract them, these two cancel out. So, that is the reason why I did this. Of course, this is from hindsight. So, I know that this term is basically the same as this. So, so as a result, I subtract that out and I get this really nice looking compact formula. So, so now I have succeeded in uh, recasting what was earlier a vectorial equation, namely Newton's second law is a vector equation. So, what do I mean by that? I mean by that uh, exactly this, that the left hand side of this equation is a vector, right hand side is a vector. But then remember somewhere down the road uh, in equation 1.6, I took the dot product. So, that once I take dot product, I am converting an equation that is a vector equation into a scalar equation. So, obviously, the implication is that the information contained is going to get diluted because earlier I had more components. Uh, taking dot product involves projecting out some of those components uh, along some direction. So, obviously, the information contained is fewer, but uh, that is just as well because uh, I really do not uh, need the information which forces me to know what the uh, forces of constraint are. So, I I purposely did this so that I do not have to, you know, care about the forces of constraint which I anyway do not know. So, so indirectly by the knowledge of the 
fact that the position of each of those particles depend on a, a predetermined set of generalized coordinate that enables me to indirectly recover the remaining uh, components of the force equation which I have uh, somehow eliminated by taking this dot product. So, I know that it is a little bit uh, difficult to put this in words, but I am sure you understand intuitively what I am talking about. So, bottom line is that uh, Lagrange equations uh, basically involve scalar quantities, whereas Newton's second law involves vector quantities and uh, there is no loss of information uh, at all, both are equal equivalent, there is in, uh, same information contained uh, because uh, the information that is lost by making this transition from a vector form to a scalar form is recovered through the knowledge that the particles specifically depend upon certain generalized coordinates that are uh, pre-assigned. Okay. So, now uh, the, uh, the equation that uh, takes the place of Newton's second law is now this equation 1.13 and the right hand side involves the forces that are acting not, not all the components, but only the components that are parallel to the rates of change of the uh, position with respect to the generalized coordinates. Okay. So, that is important because what it says is that if there are components of forces which are perpendicular to the rate, rate at which the position of the particle change as you change the generalized coordinates, those forces do not contribute to this equation. So, to give you a specific example, so this is a, this has a physical meaning which is worth uh, which is worth understanding. So, imagine you have a, a particle that is sliding along on a ring. Okay. So, now you see what is the position of the particle? It is this and what is the generalized coordinate? It is this and the rate at which the uh, position changes with respect to generalized coordinate is basically al along this, this direction, is not it? So, this is the rate of change of the position with respect to generalized coordinates. So, the delta r is tangential. So, now what, what this says is that, uh, that you have to uh, specify the uh, forces that are acting which are parallel to delta r. So, in other words, those forces have to do work. So, this is in some sense the work done. So, it is this is like F d r. So, the right hand side only depends upon forces that actually do work. Okay. So, the forces that do not do work do not contribute to the scalar version of Newton's second law. Okay. But they are important in ensuring that the particle slides along on this on this curve. So, which is uh, presupposed and assumed. So, as a result it indirectly amounts to specifying the constraint forces even though we do not know what they are. Okay. So, bottom line is that it this is how it is and then uh, the scalar version of uh, those uh, original Newton's second law can be written like this. So, now this these are purely in terms of the generalized coordinates. So, like you, so the kinetic energy is expressible purely in terms of it is expressible in terms of the velocity vector of the individual particles which are in turn expressible in terms of the time derivatives of the position and the position in uh, depends on time only through uh, the generalized coordinates which happen to depend on time and the uh, rate of change of the position of the particles depend on the uh, rate at which the position changes with generalized coordinate times the rate at which uh, generalized coordinates changes with time. So, that is chain rule. So, basically uh, the left hand side of this depends upon the way in which generalized coordinates change with time and the right hand side depends upon uh, the forces that do actually do work on the system.
and not the forces of constraint. Okay, so that's these are called generalized forces or um, well you can call it whatever you want, they are typically called generalized forces. So, the forces that actually do work. So, this is uh, as far as you can proceed if you do not know anything further about the nature of the forces that are acting. But you can do a lot more if you know beforehand that the forces that are acting are only dependent on the positions of the particle and specifically they uh, only depend upon the, so imagine uh, that uh, they only depend upon the, so each, each particle is acted upon by some external force and uh, they do not interact with each other. Suppose we assume that that is the case, it need not be that way. So, in fact, I think I have allowed that to be more general, right. So, um, yeah, so this could be more general. So, this, this, uh, this V of R, like I told you earlier, this, uh, this R is actually uh, not just, uh, this R actually means uh, all of them. It could mean all of them because the potential energy of a part of the ith particle, okay could depend upon the, uh, so it could, yeah, this is better. So, there is the potential energy of the ith particle could depend upon the positions of all the other particles including the position of that particle itself because there can be an external uh, force acting on all of them, but on top of that each particle can be experiencing forces due to the remaining particles one by one. So, so this allows for that possibility, okay. So, bottom line is that uh, if you uh, do this, uh, so here I think I have made this simple assumption that, that there is a single potential energy. So, you could, you could do that more general thing or you can uh, do what I have done in the book, which is assume that there is a single potential energy, okay. So, in other words, there is an external force and the same force is acting upon all the particles and the force simply depends only on where that particle, each of those particles are located. So, if, if the ith particle is located at some r, there is a certain force acting. Now, if you instead of the ith particle being located there, if some uh, i plus 1 particle is now located at the same point, the same force acts. Basically, V of R is the potential energy of any particle that happens to find itself at position R, okay. So, if that is the case, then the force acting on the ith particle would be simply the uh, derivative of that and then by this I mean you uh, take grad and then, okay, and then you s make R go to R i, that is what I mean by this. Okay, so, having done that, uh, you can see that uh, this, uh, if I substitute this here, okay, so what I get is uh, this, this relation. So, now uh, I can go ahead and, uh, okay, so, so it is going to be that and now if you stare at this, what is this? Again, by chain rule, this is nothing but the, um, the partial derivative of uh, the potential energy with respect to Q R, uh, Q K. So, remember that this R depends upon Q 1 up to Q S, okay. So, now uh, one more step and we are there. So, the, um, the last step is to uh, realize that the potential energy function by definition does not depend on the velocities or of the particles. So, therefore, it does not depend on the rate of change of the generalized coordinate with time. So, so we are obviously forced to make this statement and if we make this statement, then it is clear that uh, I can simply uh, rewrite uh, this as uh, t minus v if I want because d by dq dot of v is anyway 0. So, then I bring this to this side, this becomes t minus v as well because these two if I bring uh, the right hand side of 1.15 to the left hand side it becomes t minus v, but uh, 
this was t to begin with, but I can simply replace t by t minus v because differentiating with respect to q dot will anyway destroy this v there because v does not depend on q dot. So, having done all that, we are now uh, finally here and what we have written down uh, involves a quantity called L which is uh, the difference between the kinetic energy of the system of particles and the potential energy acting on that system. And this uh, peculiar quantity, it is peculiar because we are usually familiar with T plus V that is the total energy of the system. So, T minus V is called the Lagrangian and the uh, equation that replaces Newton's second law for systems where the forces are derivable through a scalar potential is now called the Lagrange equations of motion and they involve only scalar quantities. Remember that L is scalar because the difference between the kinetic energy of the system and the potential energy acting on the system. So, that is the beauty of uh, the Lagrangian approach to classical mechanics. What it does is that it uh, trades one sort of ignorance uh, with uh, certain assumptions. So, in other words, the ignorance is the ignorance of the forces of constraints. So, most of the uh, meaningful problem descriptions do not specify forces of constraint because uh, people who are uh, observing systems of particles do not have any means to measure what forces of constraints uh, uh, compel those particles to move in a per peculiar or particular way. All they can do is observe that those particles are in fact moving in that constrained manner. So, so what Lagrangian mechanics does is that it uh, it utilizes that knowledge that the particles are thus constrained and then somehow bypasses the need to know all the forces that are acting on the system and uh, is able to determine the trajectories of each of those particles even though all the forces acting on the particles are not specified. Okay, so, I hope uh, you have sort of understood what Lagrangian mechanics is. In any case, this was supposed to be a prerequisite, but uh, I hope I have succeeded in refreshing your memory and uh, I am going to stop here and in the next class, I am going to continue uh, the description of uh, point particle classical mechanics through a description of uh, Hamiltonian mechanics because we are going to be using both uh, the Hamiltonian mechanics as well as Lagrangian mechanics uh, later on for many applications uh, involving the continuum counterparts of the systems that we have just studied. Okay, I am going to stop here, uh, hope to see you for the next class. Thank you. Mm -hmm.